Hello and welcome to Hopkins at Home. Thank you for joining us. My name is Bess Vincent and I'm the Assistant Dean for Strategic Initiatives for the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. In this role, I help to coordinate JHU's Women's Suffrage Centennial Commemoration. Tonight's presentation is part of the Value the Vote series presented in partnership with Hopkins Votes. Hopkins Votes is Johns Hopkins University's nonpartisan voter registration and participation initiative, which aims to provide all JHU students with the resources and information necessary to register and cast their ballots. National Voter Registration Day is approaching on September 22nd, and we encourage you to visit jhu.turbovote.org to register yourself to vote and studentaffairs.jhu.edu slash Hopkins dash votes to find more information on what Hopkins is doing to support vote, voter turnout. Both web pages are linked below this video. Tonight, we're pleased to have Dr. Denny Wertz. A Johns Hopkins faculty member since 1994, Dr. Wertz has served as vice provost for research since February, 2014. As vice provost for research, Dr. Wertz focuses on the current and future health of the university's research enterprise, including institutional research compliance, research development, and cross-divisional research initiatives, such as the Johns Hopkins Catalyst and Discovery Awards and the President's Frontier Award. Additionally, he is the T.H. Smoot Professor of Engineering Science in the Whiting School of Engineering and directs the Johns Hopkins Physical Sciences Oncology Center and co-directs the Cancer Nanotechnology Training Center, both National Cancer Institute funded entities. He's a co-founder and former associate director of the Johns Hopkins Institute for Nanobiotechnology. Tonight, Dr. Wirtz will discuss the relationship between science and politics. I hope you'll submit questions through the talk via the chat box below this video on your screen for Dr. Wirtz, who will leave time at the end to respond. Thank you so much, Bess, for this wonderful introduction. I always say that it's a good thing my mother is not here, she'd blush. Uh, it, it's a wonderful introduction, it's a wonderful opportunity um, uh, that as a cheerleader in chief, I get a chance to um, talk about how uh, science, um, engineering, STEM fields in general are going to be very much on the ballot uh, uh, in the president's, the upcoming presidential election. For di full disclosure, I want to say that all remarks I'm going to be making tonight are my own, um, and really I, I, I do not represent Johns Hopkins. But nevertheless, as a cheerleader in chief, a lot of examples I'm going to provide you and how science matters and will matter in in the near future will be drawn from uh, this perpetually wonderful, amazingly uh, creative work that uh, my colleagues uh, put forth every day. Um, I've been lucky to be a VP for research in that, first and foremost, every day I discover how entrepreneurial, uh, how uh, forthcoming uh, and creative my uh, great colleagues all over the university have been. Um, yes, of course, in the health, uh, um, uh, field uh, and the life sciences, but also in the social sciences and the humanities. Um, and my role has been really to, to try as much as possible to, to bring together these different groups of people uh, to move forward with new questions and new solutions for societally important uh, challenges. Um, but we have in front of us, uh, in, in a matter of tens of days, a very important election. And let me quote you a stat that I thought um, really prompted me to, to say yes to Vicky uh, Schneider, who's hosting this um, event tonight, uh, to talk about uh, a vote and, and why science in the, is in the balance. Um, that is that 20% uh, of physicians, as a proxy of STEM uh, researchers or STEM people in general, uh, uh, will vote less than um, the lawyers' counterparts and 10% less than the general population. So now if you're a young undergrad in the STEM field, probability says that you're not going to vote nearly as much as maybe your good colleagues in the social sciences and the humanities, but also uh, 
uh, more as the elderly. And it's been shown again and again that um, older people are more conservative. And we need a, a plural representation of a government um, that represents all its citizens, um, at least in voting age. And so um, one of my pleas, really my only plea, is for you by the end of this presentation, for those who haven't done so yet, to register. We'll give you tips. Uh, I've gone through the process of registering, going through the process we're going to talk about uh, later tonight. Um, it takes three minutes to register, and, and then you should be good to go. So um, as I said, it's going to be a little bit Hopkins-centric. I don't know if we have um, to tonight um, guests from other institutions or other uh, kind of walks of life. Um, uh, but I think Hopkins, in the last six months in this in pandemic, have in a way was in a position to respond holistically to this terrible crisis in a way that maybe few institutions could have done it. And we very quickly collectively felt um, we had uh, the ability, but also the responsibility uh, uh, to get things done. And um, let me start with uh, what I think has become now truly pervasive is the famous Johns Hopkins dashboard, right? Um, so this dashboard, which is seen uh, several billion times a day, um, getting more views than all um, media networks, New York Times, CNN, Fox News, um, has become the neutral source of information for basic data about COVID cases and COVID-19 associated deaths. Um, uh, this started off with Professor Lauren Gardner, an engineer with some background in epidemiology, who um, along with, turns out, a Chinese born student, were seeing uh, somewhere happening in Wuhan province in China. Remember, in late January, early February, and then felt maybe they could track the spread of infection of this uh, center point um, because they knew something or two about viruses, it turns out, and that viruses don't care about borders, don't care about politics. Long story short, of course, fast forward several months and uh, there isn't a government, there isn't a media institution, things of MSN, NBC, Fox News, NBC, CNN, um, that even use that as I said, as a neutral source of information. My point is not only that a super creative a student and her advisor thought it'd be useful to create such a resource, but in a way, there's a third part to this, which was that the CDC should have been that source of information and had uh, built for over decades immense credibility to for being that neutral source of information for things like um, cases for uh, infection diseases. Um, in little time, that CDC had lost, um, in a way, its luster to some extent, the trustworthiness it gained over these years. Uh, that resource has now become um, the way by which institutions like the International Monetary Fund the World Bank, the United Nations, decide allocations of resources by countries. This has become the basis of all discussions related to policy. I'd venture to say, Lauren Garner, in a way, will not get the Nobel Prize because her work is so consequential. No, I'm kidding. That will um, turn out to be one of the most consequential researchers ever. Her work is so foundational to all discussions and I think will be in a way an inspiration for many in the future. Um, so that's one example. A second example I wanted to give you is that of a sequencing effort that was uh, launched thanks to a fund that my president Ron Daniels had the vision to create literally a week after we closed down the campus on March 15th. We said, as I said, we were well positioned because we had a deep bench of experts in, in the social sciences, in virology, in infectious disease, engineers, to address key uh, questions and 
find solution for what were then a mounting challenge of all sides. One of them was really to try to see if this virus was undergoing fast mutations. Now that would matter in many, many different ways. Okay. Um, but one of them was almost historical in that it was important, and that's the work of our researchers, to demonstrate that it turns out that the strain virus that came to our shores on the East Coast didn't come from China, but came from Europe. So any ban on travel from China was by then completely useless. Um, another one was that there was a demonstration that this virus was not undergoing some sort of hypermutational rate the way, for instance, HIV has such high proliferation rate. Now, this is good news in that most likely the vaccine we will develop and others will develop may have some lasting um, uh, 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 reliability and may be uh, used as a, some sort of single um, uh, agent or single uh, therapy, or at least prophylactic therapy, um, in that we won't have to face um, the problem of a virus that mutates so often. Um, and finally, about this point, um, we yet haven't seen any um, indication that these different mutations have led to different outcomes. So these very large variation we've seen in terms of response of patients doesn't seem to come from the fact that either the host, that's the patients, or these virus have different profiles uh, at kind of the DNA level, okay? A third example I'd love to bring up is that um, not from our virologists or in health uh, uh, specialists, but from engineers, right? uh, What shouldn't be um, a matter of politics that is wearing masks has become a matter of politics. Um, but it was important at least for our fluid mechanics experts to provide a rational basis of why really you should wear a mask. And so what these fluid mechanicians did was to um, develop cutting edge numerical simulations, demonstrating how wearing or not wearing a mask had dramatic impact on um, the importance of droplets and how the size of these droplet matters in, uh, first of all, the distance at which you should be uh, maybe talking to somebody or the important confinement, how closed environment would be uh, promoting potential infection uh, from a single cough, for instance. Um, uh, they had in a way to set aside the great project they were working on, but nevertheless use their expertise for a you know, um, uh, kind of existential threat posed to this country and the rest of the world. Um, and finally, I'd like to give you a sense um, of where we are with convalescent blood, right? Which has been uh, in the news so much recently. Again, a demonstration of how um, uh, politics in some ways got in the way where science and science objectivity should prevail. Um, back in February, Arthur Casadeval, of Cuban origin, and it's gonna matter in some other points I'm gonna make later tonight, um, wrote an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal saying that there was an old treatment dating back 100 years that had been used to stop spread of viral-based disease uh, in its tracks. And that was in a way the use of blood from uh, convalescent patients, okay? Um, of course, his idea was to modernize the idea and the process, you know, of course, matching blood types and re screening for other disease this blood could carry and um, try to see if this idea before other treatment could be used and or vaccines could be developed, provide for uh, 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 alternative strategies uh, to alleviate symptoms and maybe save lives indeed. Um, Long story short, um, after a heavy lift of uh, first 
seeding these efforts internally at Hopkins and then securing funding elsewhere uh, from Bloomberg and others, Arthur Casadeval and his uh, colleague Shmuel Shoshan um, from Israel, another important data point, um, uh, have been embarking on a large uh, double-blinded clinical trials. Um, the part of Johns Hopkins has been to uh, find out if a prophylactic uh, treatment of conventional birth of healthcare workers could prevent infections of those frontline workers. Um, uh, other institutions, um, Mount Sinai and other institutions come to mind, come together and have been working um, uh, countless hours to coordinate uh, these clinical trials, which are now taking place not only in the US, but elsewhere. By following the data, we at Hopkins feel that we're going to be well positioned to provide what we think is going to be actually an effective treatment for people. Um, remind you, uh, remember, sorry, that um, we're still going to have to wait for uh, vaccines to be not only developed and tested, um, but then produced en masse for general populations. Um, and that may take a long time. So meanwhile, you know, we need to save lives and saving lives will come from wearing masks, social distancing, and of course, washing your hands regularly. And um, also treatments such as uh, convalescent plasma. Okay. So um, again, um, science is guiding our ideas about distribution of vaccines. We have public health experts who have developed, I was just talking this morning to Bloomberg distinguished professor, Nilanjan Chatterjee, who in his daytime developed very famous polygenic score system to determine your probability to get cancer or not in different types of cancers. And decided to use that expertise to very recently establish a score uh, that would tell you the risk to be infected and if you were infected, the risk you know, of bad outcomes, including death. Long story short, he told me the, by far the most important determinant is, is age um, and um, uh, less so socioeconomic factors and then even less so obesity and diabetes status. But the point I want to make is that he's informing public health specialists. He believes if we follow the science and that's going to be your choice when these vaccine is deployed, to follow where the science tell you where to first deploy it, in the communities where it is most needed, in nursing homes, in uh, poorer communities, because that's where uh, most of victims of COVID-19 have, have and all come about. We've created completely cultural change in the scientific fields by leading the way, by demonstrating that quickly depositing data would lift all the boats. That competition between countries, if there's such a thing, that's not how I think about my own research field. I don't think about Canada versus Australia. But if you think that way, if you nationalist, that's fine. Uh, it's not, it's created the example, the way to, to uh, more faster come to breakthroughs, uh, scientific breakthroughs, and in cancer treatment. So, um, Again, uh, and we'll talk about very practical ways how you could be involved and you start by registering yourself to vote. Um, I'm seeing some um, uh, uh, questions and if that's okay with you, I'm gonna break here and switch to those questions. So I have a first question from Christina. What role can data visualization modeling play in changing public behavior which improve health outcomes. Does John Scopoli do research in this area? Actually, um, uh, I have to say that um, what I think sold quickly a lot of people to uh, Laura Gardner's dashboard was her ability to visualize this data. You know, everyone is seeing these red dots and how the size corresponding to different number locally, different number of, of cases or deaths, depending on when you switch the Kind of the options on the data set. I think that data visualization is playing more and more a, a role in science. Um, 
as we collect larger and larger data set, I think it turns out astrophysicists and astronomists have developed solutions for data visualization that are only slowly, you know, uh, going over these big fans between fields and starting being used in the health science and public health in general. And I can say that Hopkins, in a way, is the perfect forum to create these connections. My office has been eager to connect the dots. And I can point to Alex Saleh, um, world famous uh, data scientist who is now working with immune oncologists to develop ways not only to quantify slides of tumors and you know, all more rigorously, but how to visualize this data. So yes, it's become critical. And I think, again, um, we're gonna have all of us learn how to better present this data, how to tell stories better. And it starts with visualization. Great question. Andreas, do you believe that science is apolitical? If so, how did you get to a place where science is so politicized? What a great question. Um, it shouldn't be political, right? Um, what's the saying? You're entitled to your opinions, not to your facts, right? And I would love to hear from my um, uh, historians. Turns out, just more publicity about Hopkins, we have the premier um, history of science and history of technology and medicine uh, departments in the country. And I have to say, I'm gonna have to ask that question, Andreas, Send me an email and I'll put you in touch because it's such a great question. Maybe we are more attuned and more aware that data is being either ignored or manipulated, but maybe there's always been maybe milder versions of this all along you know, history. So this is a great question. I, I, don't, I can't say I have a full answer, but what I say, I know what it should be. It should be a political, but clearly it is not. Um, from Stanis. How would a systematic government blocking of immigrants impact the research environment at Johns Hopkins? What a great question, Stanis. In so many different ways. Um, so today, you open the door of offices in department of most department of engineering, department of computer science, most department of medicine, and you'll see mostly foreign-born nationals. Okay, I say national foreign-born individuals. Um, it's not that we favor immigrants over um, native born Americans, right? That's in a way the privilege of a large research and, and, and you know, prestigious research university. We've always opened the door and picked the best and brightest, at least that's the principle. And it turns out many Americans have decided that going through a long medical training or long PG training is not the cup of tea and rather make a book or two on Wall Street instead of maybe being interested in going through a long uh, train. Many foreign born you know, nationals we get to choose in a way without we and me want it to be consequential and not maybe make money. If we make money, we are clearly all in the wrong business. And I think that um, that's one thing. There's another practical matter, um, is that we want to be of consequence to the world, right? We've always opened a, not only our doors to the faculty, but uh, we're foreign born, but to our students who are foreign born. Uh, take the School of Public Health, right? Um, we were international from the get-go. It's by far the largest school, school of public health in the country, number one forever, um, in part because it is implanted in a hundred countries, right? to uh, the idea of uh, great science then being translated, implemented all over the world. Um, and that meant always um, porous borders between our academic walls and the rest of the world. It's the motto of Hopkins has always been knowledge to the world, no, not knowledge to the US. And so, yeah, um, uh, it's, it's, critical, it's existential. If we block our doors to immigration, academia will suffer readily. And, and, and the consequence on this nation will be very fast and dark. From Yolanda, can you speak 
of the shift in cultural norms outside of the US? Are countries outside of the US engaging in conflict around public health behavior that are devices as ours? What a great question. Um, you've all seen demonstration in Berlin and Paris and also this, I'll call him what he is, a charlatan, Didier Roux uh, in uh, Marseille in the south of France who's advocated for um, crazy treatments. Uh, and, um, but nothing in size and scope of what we've seen here. They featured because they're almost weird and exotic to journalists in Europe. And so yes, they'll be um, documented, you know, in a newspaper, but there isn't this, um, you know, 30, 40% of the population um, who'd balk at wearing masks, social distancing. Is there grumbling about it? Of course there is, right? Because they are inconvenience. Um, but um, you've seen uh, after and the pandemic, how government affairs just in, uh, in uh, um, uh, favor, I should say this, approval uh, rate of those governments have increased with the pandemic while decreased here in the US. Uh, uh, so no, they're not nearly as divisive, although, you know, I think fed with uh, trolls from Russia. Am I seeing Russia? Yes, I am. Uh, uh, a lot of those movements have been portrayed to be bigger than they are, at least in Europe. Um, thank you, Yolanda, great question. From Abraham, how do you believe that the global pandemic happening in election year might impact voting outcomes for individual work in the medical community? Um, I'd like to think that there's a heightened level of awareness of this medical community um, that policy happening at the federal level have direct impact of what's happening in um, uh, emergency rooms, in the hospitals, community hospitals, um, academic hospitals like Johns Hopkins Hospital. Von Michael, do you feel that the current culture of mistrust in science and data powers, sorry, data empowers others to embrace this or this is a procession fed by the media. Um, yeah, unfortunately, too often, um, media, in a way, in what I could call asymmetric positioning of, uh, say, the two main candidates and the, um, the, the, the symmetry of reporting. I think this is almost training in journalistic schools and um, almost, um, inability uh, to present asymmetric information as being such, and always trying to find a point, a counterpoint, and present two points of view has unfortunately not been the way to go and inadequate in this era where you should think data is data is data, and information, when backed with scientific data, should be objective and not up for debate and discussion. Um, so I don't wanna blame journalists too much, but there's sometimes a little bit of um, inability to present this data. And also, yes, sen 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 sensationalism. In other words, an attraction to the news story where a scandal is moved by another scandal. Who would have thought that the way to get rid of bad press is more bad press? Um, I think and friendly could be a lesson for a uh, future president of this country. Um, but um, I think that uh, unfortunately, yes, uh, there's a little bit of misperception. I I've seen outlets that the Atlantic comes to mind, New York Times to some extent, Washington Post as well, have been more neutral, especially describing the, country, the current pandemic. Uh, there's been amazing scientific reporting out of those outlets that would really strongly encourage you to do. Um, some of those sources have been Hopkins, so yes, of course, we like it. But more importantly, I think it made um, these sometimes complex scientific information, uh, I feel very um, um, uh, approachable um, and understandable to a large audience at least. Um, 
from AJ Donaldson. AJ, um, J. Chu can help solve problems of pandemic economy, climate change, racial equity, and much more. Thank you for stressing the importance of election for Hopkins to continue helping solve these global problems. I agree. I, I've, um, I want to make sure that uh, it's not just health. It matters these days, of course, more than ever. And, and as I said, Hopkins is incredibly well positioned to, to face those challenges and provide solutions to the, the country. But it's also climate change um, and it's technology and, um, and uh, social safety net and, and social justice. All scholars, I think, have provided blueprints of um, how you know proper government should work. And I hope, in a way, they'll be tapped in in, a, in an administration that would care about data and science uh, to provide that expertise, to provide this um, uh, advisory uh, uh, notion to that for them to, in a way, uh, the way it had been done in the past, in a way, the way the national academies used to be used. Um, to, to, to advise the presidents for policy would be um, resuming in a new administration. Um, from Inlet, what are the conversations happening within Johns Hopkins research community related to the role of science and data in politics? How is Johns Hopkins influencing governmental leadership? Or influence on federal governments, um, the current administration is very limited. Where we've had real impact is local government, not only in Maryland, in the city of Baltimore. Many state government ships have tapped into our public experts for advice, especially early on, places like Alabama, places like uh, Nebraska, uh, went straight to the source, so to speak, went to all uh, world famous public health experts to provide early advice on closed downs, on masking policies and on and on. And uh, so for sure, um, we've been of advice, um, but many of these governors, I think over time, have felt uh, pressure from DC, from Washington to, to change course and unfortunately stopped following our advice. Um, but um, I think, and I, 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 Lynette, you have a good, good point there, um, maybe, we should have more forums at Hopkins to see how um, science uh, and health policy, you know, and how politics, uh, where that it interfaces. We have to acknowledge where we live, right? We're not just catering to, you know, the, the coastal elites, if you will. Um, we also, um, you know, care about the rest of the country enormously. And how can we then maybe change the way we communicate information in a way that at least that maybe is less divisive. Um, and uh, um, I think it's incumbent upon us to some extent at least to be continue making efforts to be accessible in our advice. Uh, great question. For Evelyn, in a perfect world, how would Johns Hopkins partner with local, state and federal government on climate change? Wow, what a great question. Actually, um, uh, we are um, thinking about this because <laughs> underlying all of this, climate change is not taking a, a back seat um, in our everyday lives. I think the fires in the West Coast remind us that the hurricanes uh, season happening earlier and earlier in the season um, keep on reminding us of how um, you know those don't care about a pandemic or not um, that. Um, we are, uh, MAUF is organizing more conversations uh, for Johns Hopkins focus on climate change and remediation. So now that we know there's uh, warming of the planet, what could at least local and state government do to take action? And we, um, there are consequences on um, poor communities, consequences on the health uh, that will be holistically uh, uh, kind of integrated in what we hope is going to be an initiative at Johns Hopkins. So there's conversation in particular of recruiting Bloomberg distinguished professors who'd contribute to a climate change effort at Johns Hopkins. So stay tuned because that should be a very exciting um, new development um, uh, uh, that hopefully will have once again uh, kind of this 
John Sorkin's imprint of multidisciplinarity and, and of really world consequence? Um, great question. For Mester, how should the endorsement of Scientific American for Joe Biden impact STEM voters, if at all? Um, I hope it's readership. Um, what was it, first time in 175 years that the Scientific American endorsed a um, presidential candidate? Um, that should tell you something. Uh, uh, it, it's not because it's the whims of some uh, chief ed uh, editor-in-chief here in Scientific American. It's because the, this is the most important election in a lifetime, guaranteed. And um, seems like every election they say that, but this is for real. Um, so what I'd like to do is to uh, make sure you all register. So you're going to send me, that's impromptu. Uh, the people handling me don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. You're going to send me your name, well, your name is going to say from, you know, and you're going to tell me if you're registered. Meanwhile, we're going to have a video that shows you how to register. Again, I did it yesterday. Listen, even though I'm an engineer, I'm not technically savvy. If I can do it, everyone can do it. So if you're not registered yet, please follow this video. And right after, please, please, please register. And then more importantly, vote. Um, I live in DC. I could have registered the day of the election, but it said it first to go through this as a bit of a guinea pig and see if it worked, it works. And also because I felt that was a kind of a first step, a first little commitment on my part to absolutely vote uh, uh, on election day. I live in DC. The narrative could be my, my vote doesn't count. That's BS. It's not true. It's going to count everywhere you are. You live in Massachusetts or live in Nebraska. It's going to count anywhere uh, uh, this election around. I, I hope that got you excited about what's going on at Hopkins uh, now and in the future, but also how uh, uh, you, know, you need to be engaged and it starts with uh, voting. So yes, um, I'm signing off. Thank you, everyone, and um, be consequential by voting.